This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. An extra three months free on a one year package. That's expressvpn.com slash Lex pod. And now, here's my conversation with Eric Weinstein. Who's the greatest musician of all time, would you say? We were just off camera talking about Eddie Van Halen. He unfortunately oh. passed away. Who's the greatest musician of all time? Yeah. Jonathan Richman. Who's that? It's a weird question, so I'm going to give you a weird answer. It's not because Thank of you. Okay. Jonathan <laughs> Richman, the reason I'm picking on him is, is that he had a quote. Uh, he was the front man of a group called the Modern Lovers. And his quote was something like, we have to be prepared to play music. What it said was, you have to be able to strip this thing down farther and farther back to get to something that is intrinsically musical. So we were having a conversation just now about virtuosity. We we're talking about Eddie Van Halen and his recent passing. And that affected me emotionally. I don't know whether it affected you. I was never a Van Halen, the group fan, but I, I revered Eddie Van Halen's uh, capacity for innovation. Just, I saw him like, uh, you know, Rodney Mullen, the skateboarder. I had dreamed of having the two of them on my, the same podcast just to talk about what it's like to totally discontinuously innovate. And you posted a video of Spanish Fly, I think, and saying, like, I didn't know the guitar could make those kinds of sounds. Like, what is this voodoo what magic? What is it? <laughs> well, this is the thing, right? The arpeggios that he did on a single string are so fast, and the attacks uh, from the hammer-ons were way And that's why I chose Spanish Fly, because everyone, of course, will go to something like Eruption or Running with the Devil, which is the first things that they heard that let them know that there was a new force erupting out of Southern California that was Eddie Van Halen, right? I mean, I just, I, I'm in love with, I'm in love with the story of it. You're often so poetic about music. Like it clearly touches your soul on some kind of, on many levels. What is that? Is it deeper than just rocking out with the, uh, in your convertible Corvette? 69. I imagine an Eric Weinstein just driving down the California highways, blasting some kind of music. Is it just like being able to be carefree for moments of time? Or is there something more fundamental that connects to like the theory of everything and physics and life and all of that? How often do you have the chance, for example, to hear mathematics performed as you do in Bach? Right, like something with that kind of precision and elegance that can't really be grasped. Where you know, uh, to go back to Leonard Cohen's uh, famous line, "The baffled king composing," right? Such a good song. It's such a good song, but it's also like individual verses of that song are insanely important. Um, the the baffled king is how we often make music. We don't really understand what did we just do that broke that person's heart sitting on the couch, right? And so the, it's a very strange thing that you should be able to have. Think of it like you're a computer. You've got this weird open music port, you know, port 37.8, you know? Mm -hmm. Like it's not, even, it's not even supposed to be there. And, and suddenly somebody starts playing a guitar and they're making you feel things. Or, you know, like in particular, particular instruments like the violin, uh, it's so difficult. It's so unforgiving. And when it gives up its secrets, it just, you know, it, it, it wraps its fingers around your heart and won't let go. Sometimes I, I talk about head, heart, and loins. When something can grab your head, heart, and your loins at the same moment and integrate them, um, there are very few opportunities to live like that. And if you think about Eddie Van Halen, uh, 
you know, as far as your head, the, the musical innovations and the fact that he was drawing directly from the classical canon, um, you know, really speaks to the idea that maybe rock is what um, somebody like Jimi Hendrix saw it as being, you know, an infinitely extensible medium. Uh, in terms of heart, I don't even need to hear you play another note. I just like knowing that you're in the world, that there is somebody that everyone looks to that nobody, I've never heard a guitarist say, eh, I don't know. I think he was okay. Like I've never, just yeah. never heard it. You can this hate him. That guy was incredibly good looking and, you know, skin tight pants, super athleticism. Yeah. He completely owned the sexuality, the male sexuality of the stage, both being a, the completely dominant, you know, sort of mythical alpha male. I hate that expression, but there you are. But also this kind of little boy with this mischievous smirk and, you know, mm -hmm. you, the, the sense that it all came together. How could you not eat that? Mm -hmm. You get these multiple talents in the same outfit. And I think that the original Together. configuration with David Lee Roth, I mean, David Lee Roth is regulated. And I don't know that I could mm. like, like a bring him down to earth for a moment. Well, I can so also like, get pretty dysregulated, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I don't know. I don't know whether it could be magic. It could be a, a shit show. I don't know what you thought of uh, his appearance on Rogan. That was an interesting one. I loved it, but Joe and that, and Joe does this sometimes. Sometimes he just sits back and listens and he just lets yeah. like the music play, which works really well. I think you have a chance to kind of jump I into the chaos I care too. and then you'll just start and the places you will go, you may not even talk about music for like hours. It might just go to this because he, I think lives in Japan. Like there's a weird, he's, a, he's been in like an EMT after he was a rock star. He chose to become <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know, you know, it, 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 it like there's depth to that man that, uh, that hasn't been explored by him either. So I, that'll be an exciting conversation. Can we go back to Larry Cohen? I, yeah. Can we just, I the things I feel when I listen to Hallelujah by Larry Cohen or any, anything by him really, but that one. Do you really want to get into it? Let's go. What, what does it, that song mean to you? Is it love? Oh boy. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's mystery. Like it starts off about mystery. So what are you what are you doing? You're doing this alternation between the two chords, so three notes at the same time. One is called the the tonic, or you have the, the major and the relative minor, and he's alternating between them. There's only one note of difference between those two chords. One of them would be feeling sad, one of them would be more joyous, typically described. Um and so by altering one note, it's the minimal amount to take you back and forth between joy and happiness uh, as that's encoded in us. So he starts off with it. I heard there was a scene, David played the Please the Lord, but you don't really care for music, do you? Um, that's really interesting because it's he's using this technique called bathos, right? So the alternation between the sublime and kind of the guttural or ridiculous or the mundane, right? Mm -hmm. So he's like, uh, but there's a bitterness to it too. Is it just play? Well, the way I hear it, again, you know, a great song allows for different interpretations. You happen to be asking me, so I'm going to impart some stuff that probably isn't in the song, but why it speaks to me, <laughs> that's what makes there. it great. Yeah. Um, the way I hear it is he doesn't believe the audience. You don't really care for music, do you? Then what are you doing listening to this, you stupid idiots? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of, course you, of course you care for music. You're, you're too cool to care. So I see yeah. through you and screw you. That's like the kind of, that's, that's the energy I get. Yeah. Uh, then he does this weird thing. It goes like this is where he should put the description of where he is in the chord progression, which is the tonic, right? It goes like this. And then he hits the fourth and the fifth, which are the two other major elements, the subdominant and the dominant in functional harmony. So he's describing the chord progression in real time in the lyrics. 
And there's two ways this can come about in other songs. Like we had this example of um, every time we say goodbye. Do you know the song? Yeah, every time we say goodbye. No, I think it was a Cole Porter, maybe, or Gershwin, maybe Porter. I don't know. I cry a little. You know, there is no love song finer, but how strange the change from major to minor, right? Like it's beautiful oh, nice. use. Of it. Wow. Then, then there's times when it's duplicitous. So, for example, you'll have. Um, I guess my favorite examples of this are Johnny Cash's "Ring of Fire." Mm-hmm. I fell into a burning ring of fire. Then, what does he do with the lyrics and the tune? I went down, down, down. He goes up. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so the idea is like, oh, okay, that was a head fake. Yeah. Right? And another one of these, um, you know, is Nina Simone's Feeling Good. Well, okay, so what do you get? A birds flying high. You know how I feel. And sun up in the sky. You know how I feel. That so, woman's voice. It's a she new doesn't dong. give a damn, and yet she. And I'm just... feeling, but then what's the da dum, da dum? Yeah, it's like heavy stripping music. It's it's you're not in a good place. You're probably in some strip club with <laughs> some the last shady. of your money. You're drinking <laughs> l- lousy beer. Some bad situation. Yeah, and she's feeling good. No, it's funereal. It's oppressive, right? I never thought of that song that way. Wow. Well, you wow. think of it as joyous? Yeah. No, no, no. If you think about it, contrast wow. it with Ray Charles, for example. You know, do you know, do you know Lonely Avenue? Yeah. Goes, well, my room has got two windows, yeah. but the sunshine never comes through. It's really depressed. It's yeah. the same sort of song. vibe as Nina, but she's claiming that she's in great shape. So she's like a good case of the unreliable narrator. Leonard Cohen, to me, is talking about the unreliable audience that's too cool to be with the performer. Only sort of noticed subliminally. Okay. Fourth, the fifth. And then he, when he, tar- he should say something about the relative minor or the, he's giving you the secret, the yeah. baffled king. Completely. In other words, he doesn't know why it works. Yeah. Did Paco Bell know why Paco Bell's canon would work? Yeah. It was a discovery. That's the whole thing. Like some music is discovered and some music is invented. And he's talking about a musical discovery. He's talking about the Pythagorean power of the wave equation and then superimpose. Like there's two genius intellectual concepts behind music, one of which is the wave equation. Usually we solve it for a one-dimensional medium because we're talking about strings or air columns. Occasionally, you're talking about things like hand pans or steel drums or metallophones or gamelons, whatever. And those have a, a wave equation too that's much more chaotic. The other equation is this crazy thing that two to the 19 twelfths is almost exactly equal to three, which is what gave us even temperament. And so the tension between those two things is in fact one of these most beautiful stories inside of that system that formula of the baffled king is a discovery. It's not, he's not really composing it. The reason he's baffled, it's a, imagine that you took like a little brush and you started brushing off, uh, you know, a pyramid under the sands. You, you might think that you created the pyramid by your brushing, but in fact, it, somebody else did it. That's why you're baffled, right? Oh, that's beautifully put, you're right. And as, as creating one of the greatest songs of all time, and as he's doing it, he's baffled. And he's and, and and it's he meta. Leonard, he's within the song. And he Leonard is baffled, is my my contention. But he knows enough to know that he's baffled. Right? And so the idea is that he is composing. He has the audacity to compose as David. He's echoing David at a minimum. And then in a later song, which I really wish we would discuss, that's totally dystopic, and you will not like it at all, uh, is The Future, which contains this line that I, I think I used in my episode with Roger Penrose on The Portal. Uh, Note the subtle plug. The He's, Portal, The Portal. 
three, Gordon Lightfoot and uh, Warren Zevon. By the way, Bob Dylan, if you're out there, appear on either one of our podcasts. We need to get your voice into a new medium for a new group. Definitely. This is a time, this is a time for Bob Dylan, my friend. <laughs> Honestly, you've been doing an amazing job in this space. One of the reasons I'm super excited to do this podcast again is that um, I've learned some things about what I don't do well. And I also have sort of struggled with the question, should I do those things better? Because what if it's, you know, I always use the same example of the fitted sheet when you're trying to put a queen size fitted sheet on a king size mattress. He's like, okay, I got that corner squared away. And then you get another corner that pops off and they have yeah. to go back around. I wonder whether I can improve my style in the ways in which, uh, you know, I, I think it's just a recognition of a difference. You do a better job of getting to the soul of a really top intellectual guest and making them accessible and presenting them as themselves for a huge number of people. And I, I'd give my eye tooth to be able to do that. Hey, do you ever think about this? Like, cause I think about what is the greatest conversation I'll ever have? Hmm. You know, like in, in a sense, the portal, not to reduce it to, to anything, but there will be the greatest conversation. You may have already had it, but it's very possible if, if if enough people like me can keep twisting your arm to keep doing the portal, please, that is, there'll be an amazing conversation. And one of the questions that I ask myself is like, who is the person that I'm especially equipped? For some reason, I'm convinced on Putin. There's something in my head that says, I, I, I can do this man better than anyone else in this world. I got this thought in my head about it. I don't know why. And I'm convinced, but I think the universe works in that way. Like if it tells you it's going to happen. The way I would say it is, is that almost everybody who becomes a Supreme Court justice believes at a very early age, they're <laughs> going to become a Supreme Court yeah. justice. Many people believe at an early age that they can do it. Don't yeah. get there. If I don't, decide that someone is capable and that that somebody is me and i you know, if i apply that to everyone else on the planet then nobody's going to do anything and so i do think that one of the things that people like you and i get is who are you to say that right f that man just sign me up for some dunning kruger yeah but it's multiple minds like you said like this morning I was feeling so good and confident about, I couldn't think no wrong. And I remember last night clearly thinking that I'm the dumbest human who's ever lived. Yeah, and agree. nothing I've ever said is worth anything. And what the fuck am I doing with my life? Why am I scared? I'm, I was terrified of this conversation. Who the hell this am I? This conversation? Because I'm an idiot. And because, you know, I, 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 Lex, it, 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 but. No, no, no. But this morning, uh -huh. <laughs> I was the baddest motherfucker who's ever walked this earth. So it was, it was I, I was very conscious. I think it was the coffee. I'm not sure. Maybe some sleep. This sounds very Russian and it involves <laughs> multiple beverages, some of them being alcoholic, others containing caffeine. There's, in fact, I can't share the story behind it, but there is a bottle of vodka in the fridge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I, sh I should have hit you for coffee because this is a morning. There's a morning show here. So I put out a call that we get a chance to have this conversation and people ask these wonderful questions. A few people asked about depression and suicide. It's a, it's a, this, this is a Russian program, so we we'll have, <laughs> we'll have to go there. Uh, and I, I think about Leonard Cohen and one of the things that... How much he suffered. See, I guess one way, I'm not sure where we can go with this question, but do you think about the places that the mind can go, like these dark places? Yeah. Is there something like where the only escape out is suicide, for example? That's the darkest version of it? That, I really think suicide is a big place and suicidal ideation and self-harm and... We don't talk a lot about it. 
um, it's, it's a similar problem to trying to talk about trans. These are umbrella categories. And if the commonality is, is that somebody harms themselves, but we don't know whether that's coming because of a problem in brain chemistry, because of an event in their life, um, whether evolutionary programming for suicide is weirdly normal, whether or not it might have a religious motivation. Uh, there's, there's too many different forms. I, I'm old enough to have, you know, had Pete Seeger come to my college when I was uh, at university. Check okay. out Odetta, Odetta. When, we, when we're done with the interview. Um, she was a civil rights figure, but also just had a profound voice and great musicianship. These people were in the struggle. Take on the the Weltschmerz, you know, the pain of the of the planet, or you can try to do something else, which is to be a happy warrior, even if the odds are terrible and the and, and the cost of failure is catastrophic. So even when surrounded by darkness, but the thing is with Leonard Cohen is he created such beautiful music, and yet it's like Anthony Bourdain, the same. And yet they go to this dark place. And it could be, it's easy to say it's just biochemistry. No, there's a linkage between this highly generative, creative side. Yeah. And in some cases, dark depression. In other cases, not. So you can't say that it's tied, that genius and madness are always you know, co-traveling or that beauty and pain are one and the same. What you can say is that there's a cluster of people that tell you that for that cluster, there is a relationship between the darkness and the beauty. And I do think that in part, it's squaring circles. System of the wave equation and the perfect system of even temperament. They're both perfect. They're not compatible. And once you realize that there is perfection and an inability, purely acoustic. For some reason, I always, I couldn't imagine Eddie Van Halen separate from the band in front of thousands of people just screaming and rocking out with lights everywhere. And Spanish Fly made me think like, it made me imagine him sitting alone on a couch in a room. I think that's who he was. I really do. I, I mean, I, I, I it's, believe me, I get it. Yeah. He was a rock star. He was a rock guy. Got it, got it, got it, got it. I'm almost positive that you can't get to where he got to without being a complete introvert. Yeah, like it made me imagine that there's like some half-naked supermodel <laughs> walking around hoping that uh, they can, you know, do their thing together and Eddie, he's completely he'd disinterested he'd be with the guitar he'd be with the guitar right yeah that because like honestly at some level in, in one case you know maybe you're maybe you're conquesting maybe you're pursuing love and romance in the other case you're you're talking about a relationship to the to the order the creator the <laughs> almighty whatever it is you want to call that substrate that is reality and you know do I believe that Eddie Van Halen and Jimi Hendrix and Paganini and Heifetz jacked into the, you know, the true essence of the world? Yeah, they did. I don't think it's as good as differential geometry. I'm sorry. I do think it's amazing for other reasons. And thank God, because it's very difficult to communicate differential geometry at scale. But the thing about eruption, for example, mm -hmm. what level do you want to come into eruption? Do you want just the sheer majesty and pageantry? Do you want the theatrics? Like you could put him on on wires and you know, set his pants on fire or whatever, and you know it'd be it'd be totally in keeping with it. On the other hand, you want to talk something completely precise that you know shows. Up. There's a precision to it, which and which is very different than Hendrix. There's a messiness to Hendrix that, to me, somebody who has OCD has always been 
Well, how does Hendrix struggle. affect you? I mean, let's, let's have the Jimi Hendrix conversation. I don't know that we can do anything to it that hasn't already been done to it. <laughs> Maybe that's not true. Maybe the idea is that every generation has to have its Hendrix conversation, and this is a long-form It's podcast. Jimi Hendrix experience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. I hear he stole it from Joe Rogan. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many details. One, it hurt my soul on so many levels that you can put a thumb over the guitar to to play a note to to hold the note and it, it doesn't because i wanted to be the russian virtuoso that sits with his classical guitar in a perfect form plays really fast with the fingers and and then you don't want you want the thumb to be perfectly relaxed and supporting Sorry, the that's neck. the russian conservatory student conservatory so yeah then there's the, the russian wild man which one is that? Well, <laughs> haven't they're different Russian archetypes, right? So the completely idiosyncratic Russian is very different in a weird way from the, uh, you know, I can do this backwards in any key in any in my sleep and in in any time signature that you you know just just snap your fingers. We've discussed my uh, piano tuner. In previous episodes? No, no, that was offline conversation. You told me the story. That, but I should that, tell you the story. You should, tell, you should retell the story. <laughs> there I was in darkest Manhattan Yeah, with the world's shittiest, uh, it wasn't even an upright, it was a spinet piano. A friend had given it to me. The piano fell out of tune and I would have to tune it. And the only tuner I knew was this Russian guy and I hated dealing with him. There was something about his attitude that just really rubbed me the wrong way. So anyway, my wife says, tune that thing. So we get the, the piano tuner to come and he's tuning this. He's like, are you sure Are you sure you want to tune this, this, this piece of shit? You know, okay, fine. So he's like, okay, it's your money. The phone rings and I have the, the phone ringer set on a landline to Paganini Caprice 24. And immediately as the phone rings, he figures out what key the phone... <laughs> story what do you think about that that movie that movie it's what about it? it's mit it's yeah i guess when i think of that film i think about matt damon as a young guy risking everything giving up harvard i think you know probably the most accomplished group of people in the world are people who choose to give up harvard voluntarily Beautiful, right but that's true he, bigger than harvard that's very I think, true you know ives was one of these people um bill gates of course uh and then oddly uh you know zuckerberg what zuckerberg but then uh, steve jobs gave up a reed and reed is like the weirdest craziest college in the world people <laughs> should pay much more attention to reed and i'm sorry it's going through a hard time at the moment but what it was before the current craziness is really an interesting story irregardless as we say in the 617 area code um i think that a lot about a, a lot of my reaction is to the the real story of matt damon uh, having this vision and being the young guy to pull it off and you know, I also think about Robin Williams trying to explore heart through this lens of acting. And, you know, as you and I, you, you've hung out with comedians. They know that they are a screwed up bunch of people. They do. They'll, they're proud about it. They really are. The idea that Robin Williams, who I saw many years ago when I was in L.A. Um, in the comedy clubs around here, you know, he was a straight up crazy, dysregulated genius in tremendous pain. And his desire to do it earnestly through acting rather than constantly by just sniping, you know, or 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 being a clown or or, or showing us how fast his mind worked relative to ours. Um I I was really moved by that. I thought that he he brought some authenticity. And took a huge risk for a comedian to be that real. And again, like you said, it doesn't always have to be. But in that case, the madness and the genius were neighbors. That one couldn't have been any other way. Yeah. No, because his mind, I, you, you, 
The thing about seeing him in a comedy club was that he would react to random stimulus in the environment. You know, it could be a heckler. Sometimes you almost got the feeling that he wanted a heckler because it was it gave him something to play against, right? He was just I, he was infinitely instantly inventive. But I actually, to me, the best Robin Williams is as he got closer and closer to the end of his life because there was a sadness and he's almost fighting the sadness with this improvisational, like the weapons he has. All silent, you can see the sadness. And, And I don't know, there's something so beautiful about that. It's like this bird with a broken wing that's like trying to fly. You know, and it's getting older and older. And it, um, I mean, those th- he would have made a one hell of a podcast guest. I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you that. That's a sad. Um, yeah, I have some that, sadness that I really do think that part of what we call podcasting is actually just getting to know a soul right. over and over again. Like, yeah, maybe the idea is that this is talking about depression and sadness and heavy feelings is not an american specialty seeing that in context with the beauty of life is a russian specialty like the, it is very much specialty it sounds like a diner menu what yeah you want the it's russian like... special <laughs> <laughs> a big, uh, <laughs> big scoop of ice cream with tons of depression in large measure because we hadn't noticed that we were getting a benefit from having no plan, not having to make a plan for low growth. As long as we had growth, we were in great shape. Let's imagine that there was a, that you could run an experiment. You have a billion copies of earth and you start the initial conditions slightly different on some giant number of planets, a lot of the things that were discovered from the 1800s through the end of the 20th century are discovered in a period of time because a lot of that just has to do with once you crack the puzzle of getting better instruments, you can see more. And the more you can see, the more you can make use of what you can see. And it turns out there was lots of stuff to do with like, you know, germs or uh, electron orbitals or you know spectrum electromagnetic spectrum and so we, we got to do all of those things and the u.s roughly corresponded for a good chunk of its history with this bonanza and so of course we look like an amazing genius country we have no plan imagine that you you could sell a car you don't have to put in seat belts you don't have to put in airbags you don't have to put in rear view mirrors or sensors or a rear view mirror. You could save a lot of money on a car by not putting in all of the stuff to keep things from going wrong. And I think that's what we had. We had a machine that as long as growth was insanely good, we plowed it back, the, the riches and spoils and, and treasure back into the system and made more genius stuff. And we carried along a good chunk of humanity, hundreds of millions of people. We did not have a plan for what happens when the growth goes below the stall speed of our society. How confident should we be that the growth has slowed in in a way that uh, is permanent rather than a kind of slap in the face where we... It's not the right concept. Right concept is, I, I, I try to use the same words over and over again in case people see mold because then the perseveration actually gets somewhere. So I use this analogy of the orchard because everyone talks about low hanging. Mm-hmm. Orchards, we're not looking for forests. We're, we're just sitting here arguing about low hanging fruit. So my claim is there's probably a lot more low hanging fruit and it's not here. It's in other orchards. It's in- Life, the productivity, all the, everything. It'll change everything. So I'm excited about that orchard. So I'm sit, you know, I'm roaming that orchard and wondering how the hell you kind of bring back like the ant that finds a new. If 
kind of shows how privileged you are as an ant. Get out of the colony. <laughs> Kill him. Kill him. Well, that's probably not a great model for finding new orchards. And I think that what we find is that where there's a system that allows somebody to ascend without a lot of gatekeeping, you can have that. But, you know, I saw... Because they were places that had funding and had freedom. And in general, really smart people want to be free and they don't want to think a lot about how they're going to, you know, feed themselves. They want to get lost in their minds. So you can either give them productive places to play, dangerous places. Mm -hmm. Trying to divvy up the 13th century pie and you destroyed your ability to get to the 20th century. You'd, you'd be an idiot. But one place I think I disagree with you is uh, I don't think you need that many people to empower the geniuses, the innovators, the people who refuse to spend most of their days in meetings about fairness. This is good. Uh -huh. Let's have a disagreement. I think podcasting, whatever you call that medium, is just one little example of a tool that you can give power to like you and your podcast can have the next Elon Musk and make him a star. Now I see where you're going. Okay. There has been a series of places for people to play and be free. And we've lost them successively. What's a good place you remember? Because I, I disagree with you there too. I think they're still there. You can still play. You interviewed Noam Chomsky. Yes. Okay. Noam Chomsky comes from an era where you can play. Meetings, there's all the all, usual all, crap. All the usual crap. But there's in the eyes of individuals. Yeah. There's this glow of excitement that has nothing to do with career. I understand this. And and this is it's still a playground. There's little little pockets of playgrounds from which genius can emerge still. And they're unaffected by diversity meetings or fairness meetings or or blah, so blah, blah. I love to hear this. Yeah? Well, you don't think so? I don't believe it. Because I've watched the change, Lex. I've watched mm -hmm. people edit. You, you, we are all editing ourselves all the time. I remember my old mind. I liked it better. All of this relentless focus on critical race theory and you know, critical theory, postmodernism, fairness, social justice. It's making many of us into worse people. You think that's, do you think the Mad Damons are of, you know, the character is paying attention to any of that? You think that has an effect? Have you seen what happened to Matt Damon himself? Matt Damon has tried to say various things at various times that seem to be relatively well, innocuous. He can't, can't speak. Okay, well, let's, let's not mix up matt damon is just an actor the, uh, well, no, no no he was just a harvard student who <laughs> came up with his own genius screenplay acted and made it happen no yeah no but we're, we're somewhere else you don't think you can build a rocket company no no of I, MIT do think, still? I think that there are things that you can still do but we're losing them we lose them we keep losing them i would say the biggest problem here, let me just say, like, what I think the solution would be is to fire anybody who is doesn't ha like, who's not fac like faculty, especially young faculty, should have way more power, and administration should have much less power, because right now the administration, uh, which used some of the whom used to be faculty, but they've lost the fire, the spark that gave them, they've lost the memories of the playground. And so the people that admire and love the playground, like you could see it in their behavior, should have way more power. And so we should create a systems that give them power. I Lex, think you're very idealistic. Yeah. And you're very, you've got a huge heart. It's a weird time because I don't want to dissuade you from believing beautiful things um, because I see how potent you are. You 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 do all these things: jujitsu, guitar, podcasting, programming, computers, um, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think you're right. I think we're in a really 
deeply screwed up place where even the tiny number of let me give you an alternate version of this dystopia I do think that there are people who are capable and there's still places to play and cause things to happen that progress the story forward. But if you look at the the fire that some of the people are in who fit that profile, like how much crap has Elon Musk taken? Quite considerable. Right? And not much ad- admiration from the Craig prof- Venter. Jim Watson these are very difficult people. Steve Jobs is a very difficult guy, you know? Yeah, it, it is a bit heartbreaking to me. I mean, everybody is different generations. I just... See how few faculty and uh, people with Nobel Prizes and so on uh, admire Elon like how little prop he gets he gets a lot of fans from like people who buy his products and you know young minds yeah just excited but like why don't we as institute why doesn't mit say that we want to we, we is it in kung fu panda which you've watched now yes yes what does tai lung say when uh He's looking for the dragon warrior and the furious five come to defeat him on the bridge. One of them gives up Poe's name accidentally. And Tai Lung hears it. Poe, so that is his name. Finally, a worthy opponent. Our <laughs> battle will be legendary, right? Yeah. He's excited. Why is that? Well, you learn about this in boxing. Sometimes you'll see a division or an MMA which is lousy with talent. It's just you can't swing a cat without hitting an amazing, amazing athlete. Sometimes you'll have a division which at that particular moment has one star and no real competition in that weight class or something. That person is in bad shape because you can't build a legend without the other. When you think of Muhammad Ali, what are the names that you immediately think of? And you have to, Frazier, you have to think of the other heavyweights. Liston. Right. So those those opponents are in part what made Muhammad Ali Muhammad Ali. And that's, you know, that's why the the um, Mayweather-McGregor revelation that, okay, this guy has got his opponent's picture in his house. How weird is that? Well, because without the opponent, you may not be able to get there. Now, I am not a huge fan of the wrong kinds of rivalries. Yeah, that's that's the golden that's the golden kind of sweet spot. Um, most of these people can't do what Elon's doing because they can't break rules. They can't take the pressure. I'll tell you what really concerns me about your perspective. I think that there are a lot of genius ideas are not necessarily going to push an idea if it results in 10 years of being derided. Very few men are willing to do that either. But there are some of us who are so dumb that we will pig-headedly stick to an idea for 10 years, even if the world collapses. I don't think that there are as many women who are going to make that calculation, even if they know the idea is correct. And w- one of the things that I believe technology can help us fight the trolls of all definitions of troll. Like, I believe that a better Twitter can be built. Interesting. I do not. I don't believe that a Twitter successor can be built that solves most of the problems. I think you can always improve what we have, yeah. but I don't think that converges in something that really works because I think ultimately the problem isn't Twitter, the problem is us. For example, I recently made a very disturbing realization, which is academics and trolls have very many similar behaviors. Absolutely. It's largely a trolling community. I tend to believe that the trolls 
are not, it's like the Peter Thiel many mind idea. Yeah. Which in all of the trolls, there's the possibility of goodness. And all you have to do, not all you have to do, what you have to do is create technology that incentivizes them to uh, to embrace, to, to discover, to embrace, to practice the, the, the better angels of their nature. And I believe that like the, the people actually want to do that. The trolls is a short term dopamine rush of uh, childish toxicity that all of us want to overcome. I believe that like deep within, it's, we want to overcome that. I, I, I try to keep myself from believing what you believe. <laughs> <laughs> because you'd be disappointed if it's not because true. it's dangerous because a lot of these people are implacable foes and there aren't many of them but when you meet somebody who's like yeah i just like screwing people up i'm here for the pain i i, I just believe even in them there's a good there's a wonderful book that i'm going to recommend to you where i hope this comes from maybe i've got the source wrong but in any event it's a great book called <laughs> yeah. uh maximum city about bombay mm -hmm. And I believe the, the, the conceit is that the author um, leaves Bombay as a kid and comes back as an adult. And he realizes he, he has to rediscover the city because he can't live in the city he left. So he, he gets in contact with all of the weird areas of the city. And one of them is the underworld. He hangs out with the police. But in the underworld, he's talking to contract killers. And... Um, he says, you know, it's really weird. Everybody pleads for their life right before I kill them. And they always say this thing about, I've got a, I've got two kids at home. He says, never say that to a contract killer because we have terrible relationships with our parents. <laughs> Doesn't endear us to you. <laughs> and I was just thinking like, uh, yeah. oh, wow. So there's a minus sign in front. Of you. I, um. By at least walking along with me through this worry of mine, it's you. Do you think we're headed towards some kind of civil war? Some kind of division that explodes beyond? I, I believe we're in a revolution, as you know. I've called it the no-name revolution or N-squared revolution. I've been talking about it for years. I don't think, I think waiting for this to be called a civil war is not smart. Only history will call it such. Fine. But I think that the problem is, is that you're encountering things that you've never seen, trying to fit them into things that you already know. Right. And, but history re repeats itself. Yes. Ish. <laughs> you don't see lessons from history. In I do. We see today. But I don't see it repeating itself. You know, the, 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 what about famous, violence? the famous quote is that it rhymes. It rhymes. I mean, the thing I'm, I guess I'm speaking to is violence. And we're in there. The abstraction of violence. Imagine you were coding up violence as an abstract class. Okay? Thank you for speaking to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to lose these people. Come with me. <laughs> Go no, no, on. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, look, I've dealt with your audience, and your yeah. audience contains yeah. the smartest people around. Yeah. I guarantee you, if I say some stuff, uh, first of all, any wrong thing that I'll say, they're yeah, going to detail. They're gonna, so that, yeah. that'll be a little bit of catnip to, to bring yeah. in the smart people. <laughs> but they'll also digest it for each other. It's one of the great lessons of long form podcasting. If you don't, if you don't waste all your time explaining things, that's the job of the audience to do amongst themselves they're happy doing the work and those who aren't they leave isn't that great they'll leave the people who don't want to struggle will leave and you can get rid of them i think that the point is you you would want to say violence is defined relative to a context so let's call it meta violence so that we don't get into the the problem with, we already have a term for physical violence right so we have meta violence and physical violence I would say that physical violence is subclassed from meta violence. Meta violence is the disruption of a, a system. It's sort of, you know, it's a 
you know, for, for example, if a cell dies, it can die through apoptosis or necrosis. Apoptosis is controlled, programmed cell death. Uh, necrosis is just like, okay. Spoons and forks. Do you have a sense that the spoons are good utensils and the knives or forks are bad utensils because they're mean? I mean, like, if you start thinking in these terms, yeah. that knife is there to do violence. That's violence you want done. Right? right? When I cut a mango, I'm doing violence to the mango. The mango expects that I will do violence to it because otherwise it, I won't be able to get the, the meat and it won't get its seed um, spread somewhere else. So in part, violence is absolutely part of our story. So, okay, so there's this meta-violence class. Yeah. And what's... So the meta-violence class is already, you know, it's a multiple inheritance pattern. Whatever's going on right now inherits from meta-violence. No, but there's there's certain <laughs> subclasses that allow evil to emerge. So what 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 I'm specifically worried about is that the yeah, what's on your mind, Lex? What's what's really going on? Okay, I I worry that um, amidst the chaos of you have these protests or the chaos that could be created by the feeling that the election does not represent the the voice of the people, like saying that whoever gets quote unquote wins the election according to the some kind of reporting of the numbers that come out, that's not going to represent what people actually want, who people actually want to be the leader. Like something in that narrative will create so much division that people will resort to literal violence, like protests that really, that the United States loses its united aspect. And because of that, because of that chaos and tension, evil, evil people, evil forces, that my definition of evil. And so how do we let love win in this moment? of we're gonna potential have to chaos. For it. You're gonna have to become a fighter. And you have to, you're gonna have to throw some serious punches if that's what you want. You have to be Muhammad Ali here because the moment you start criticizing anything, yeah, people, you have to be a masterful communicator because- That's why you're here. Look, Lex, in part, your decency is allowing you to do things that you couldn't otherwise do. I saw that you had Michael Malice on your podcast. Yeah. Now, Michael Malice is, I think of somebody who at his best is extremely shrewd and insightful, yes? Mm -hmm. He's also got this trolling game, which he's quite open about, and you talk to him about it, which I can't stand. And that's, this is the idea. Oh, grandpa doesn't get the internet. Well, I'm grandpa. I don't get the internet. I don't love the trolling. Yeah. There are trolls of the past who were incredibly good. I don't see any of the modern trolls as being that kind of Anything that stands up gets cut down. Yeah. You know, it's like anything earnest. You have to turn into cynicism and a meme and look. It's, it's this idea that the people who believe that the world is chaos and has no point are constantly trying to let you know, don't try to use the internet for meaning, for decency, for goodness, because we are going to find out that that's all sanctimonious hypocrisy. And we will, we will make you suffer. So I do think that there's a lot of sanctimonious hypocrisy in the world. Some of it mine, some of it yours, but we all have it. And the trolls somewhat remove that. But it's not a judicious, kind, constructive, compassionate, caring version most of the time. And a lot of those trolls, and I, I have this feeling about Michael Malice, I don't know whether it's right, that there's somebody who deeply cares and loves beneath it. And that that's motivating some of the trolling behavior. And you and I don't seem to be doing that. I don't see you as 
almost ever and true. It's like I, everything we say, we say like I'm, I'm for it, I'm against it. This isn't my native language. I speak nuance. I don't speak this internet shit. And and I, the, right. the more I have to communicate through internet shit, right? I almost never take a tweet seriously if it contains the the letters L M A O, L O L R T F L, you know, F O L. Mm-hmm. There's an interesting effect where people say stuff and then finish with L O L. You, you you put it beautifully that it indicates to me that this is a person we've talked about like why I wear the stupid suit yeah is like this is anti this is to fight the L- lol at the end of sentences is take it's like stand up for the words you're saying yeah don't finish stuff with lol removing completely the responsibility of the content of the sentence that preceded it yeah also choosing the outfit that worked both for men in black and the blues brothers <laughs> not a terrible choice <laughs> okay but getting back look lex we're not in a position to do this you need to be seated in a different chair your chair is the wrong chair you're in the wrong chair it's been so long all right i, I want to talk about you and joe biden joe biden was a 29 year old guy with nothing particular going on so far as i can tell Okay. I know people as impressive at age 29 as Joe Biden, you know, 12 rows back, three, three deep, doesn't matter. Huge number of people. None of them my age can get to where he got to. Like we're all morons. Anytime somebody takes out, like if you found Eddie Van Halen in a guitar shop, you'd be angry. What is this guy doing repairing guitars? Then somebody will say, maybe he loves to repair guitars. Yeah, I mean, what what is your Russian piano tuner doing? What is my Russian piano? That that was the whole point of that story, which is what is it that happened in that life that converted in the world that's not sitting in its proper seat yeah and quite honestly i've gotten to the point where my feeling is we've got to take the seats right and maybe we don't sit in them maybe the idea is that we take the seats and we put some smart gen z person in the seat and say look no chanting i don't want to hear you say no justice no peace if there aren't verbs if it if it rhymes, it's wrong. Like I used to have this thing: if it rhymes, <laughs> things that rhyme are more true. Yeah. But like in general, if something starts at one, two, three, four, I don't want to hear what the rest of your sentence is. Yeah. But I, I feel like the responsibility that you carry, that I carry, this is where Joe Rogan generally removes himself from being. I'm just a comedian. This idea of I'm just a comedian. They all do that. But at this moment in history, many here among us who feel that life is but a joke. That's not us. The hour is getting late. That's not us. In the song, the 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 Joker and the Thief are on opposite sides of Jesus having this conversation over Jesus. You and I, we've been through that. That's not our fate. That's somebody else's fate to throw spitballs at the internet. That's not your fate. You're an earnest guy. You're filled with love. You're getting the most amazing podcast guests. You're but you can win over speech. the internet. This is the point I'm trying what? to make. That you're saying I'm 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 just a grandpa. I don't know the internet. No, I'm telling you, you're going to get bigger, and then you're going to get cut down. You're going to keep ascending for a while, Lex. And then you're saying, and naturally, there's. I'm a telling problem. you, I watch the same process. People get up to a certain level. And one of the things that's going on, in my opinion, with Joe Rogan is, is that when Joe Rogan starts to talk about his misgivings about Joe Biden, you know, in a way that you find at any bar in America, about cognitive decline in a 77-year-old who's about to be 78, I believe in November, 
We have never had anything remotely as insane as a 78-year-old person slated to win the war. Why Jon Stewart and why Joe Rogan and why Bill Maher and all these people to some extent hide behind. As you gain more power, you can stand... You, you There's a your fight over Joe Rogan job. right now. I mean, I, I've talked about it for a few years now. People did not understand how big that program was. People didn't understand long-form podcasting. I was derided by people who I think of as being very shrewd um, for believing in these podcasts as a major force. And most of the people who derided me have said, wow, did, did I not get things? It's like if you started to propose... Um, you know, you wanted to do the Sopranos, uh, in the era of 30 minute sitcoms. Um, it's like, you don't get it, man. The American people, they're not interested in these long plot storylines. That's your weird thing. Nobody cares, dude. Everybody just wants short, fast, memorable. And like, okay. So if you do that, you totally miss the opportunity. And you know, the savvy people used to say, Kid, let me tell you, nobody ever lost a dime underestimating the intelligence of the American people. Well, that was totally wrong because they didn't calculate opportunity costs. I have been talking about the problem of, of Joe for a long time. Um, the problem is, is that when the system wakes up, they're going to want to control it. And they, they have different, they come up with new different mechanisms of doing that. I guess one interesting one is cancel culture. Well, look it's, at the number of people around Joe who they've come after since they've realized that Joe was really big. Joey Diaz, Brian Callen, um, Chris D'Elia. Now, I'm not saying that those are all related, but I do notice that there are at least correlations between when Joe says something and when something bad happens in Joe's universe. It's easier for me to believe that that's happening when it's happening around Joe himself. Yeah. But I'm worried about my friend. Yeah. And I don't necessarily want to push him towards being more if he doesn't want it. Because I don't think, I don't want to, I don't want to conscript people. He's got a great life. He's got a great situation. He's done a huge service. Thank God. Do you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. How, how much do I owe Joe just for what he's done for you to say nothing of what he's done for me or for Brett or for Sam or any of these people? And, you know, I, I'd like to think that we all try to give back, but I'm worried about Joe. He's well, not worried. One of the inspiring things about Joe yeah. is, I mean, he's in this war alone and the way he fights the war is by just enjoying life well, that's like his thing. As cooking. long as he stays close to things that he loves and being, you know, one of the things, is he's honest about his drug use. He, lo he loves to hunt. So he's, he's just, he does a certain amount of... Like, ...who Joe is. And he, yes, he, he doesn't act as if he went to a fancy finishing school. Right? That's not his energy. The fact that you've got some super smart guy who always pretends to be a meathead, just like, you know, yeah. it's like, hey, I'm a comedian. It's yeah. like all these defenses and disguises. Yeah. Okay. In a week where that message like bleeds throughout the words like, yeah. in the gaps between. And that that's so inspiring to me that the good people can win by just being good. And, well, and, and he's kind and he's tough. And he also, he's no pushover. <laughs> no. no. I, I always worry a little bit when I sit down in that chair. <laughs> you still get scared that he'll call you on some kind of bullshit that you weren't even aware of? No. It, <laughs> the first time I was on the show, the energy wasn't great between us. Yeah. And it was in a sober October situation. Yeah. So I think I hadn't understood that. And maybe our egos got a little bit off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I try. I, I was having fun, but maybe it was just two complicated life forms getting to know each other. But the first one was probably 
Um, yeah, that made me a little nervous for the future. But then, you know, Joe, Joe and I have become friends, although sometimes we have miscommunications. Like on Yom Kippur, I, I texted him and I said, Joe, you know, I, I want to apologize for uh, ways I've let you down as a friend and haven't been there for you and appreciate everything you've done for me. All this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I get this text back, like, what the fuck is your problem? <laughs> <laughs> you're great, dude. I don't know what bad place you're in, but cheer up. It's like, Joe, don't you have any Jews in your life to <laughs> apologize for what they've done? He was just like, dude, have you lost your mind? What the hell's gotten into you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What What do you think? Uh, what do you think about the Spotify thing? What about it? Ask me a question. He's now, as opposed to being just a comedian with a podcast, he now is just a comedian with a podcast who stepped like in the middle of the center of cancel culture, which is like, it's, I know Spotify is in Sweden, but they represent Silicon Valley. They represent the very kind of structures they contain and represent the kind of structures that threaten to destroy the Elons of the world. Mm. And he just like stepped like with his Alex Jones and his uh, the Joey Diaz just strolled right into the middle yeah. of it. I think so, it's awesome. <laughs> I love it. But do you think he'll he's strong enough to? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know the right way to ask this. But is he strong enough to persevere? It's a bit interesting. It's like when a lion decides, "Wow, that honey badger looks tasty. I'm going to swallow it whole. See what happens." <laughs> because I, I talked to him offline. He really seems to be willing to give away the hundred million, which gives him so much power. Oh. I don't, <laughs> it's a powerful thing to be able to say, I don't, yeah, to the, the honey badger. <laughs> he just strolls in, but he's willing to walk away from anything in this. Well, place. he's going to walk out the other side of the, yeah. uh, the lion. I don't think he's going to go out the way he came in. I just disagree with you. I okay. mean, because you have to, you have to do it. Like you've I'll said this what. many times before. I'll bet you. Yeah. I'll bet you. Uh, a bottle of Stoli that you can get uh, if you you get Joe Rogan to get highly politically active and call out the system for all the bullshit that it is in a very pointed and determined fashion. Uh, and he doesn't get destroyed. I'll give you. I'll give you the vodka. The vodka. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty damn good deal. So, yeah. but this you've said this. I mean, this no is, living heroes, my friend. No living <laughs> heroes. Living. I just. No living heroes. It's it's just difficult. You just have to be good at it. I mean, if you just say generic political things, no, no, you it it you're going to be taken down. But the if more you're heroic a, you are, with it. the more beautiful you are, the more you will be made to suffer. If they cannot get you on reputation, if Jesus himself came down, I don't know if I ever read. Uh, I, I probably have never read to you the hit piece I did on Jesus. You don't know about this? No, I did not know. I did hit pieces on all of the best people in the world. Wow. So whoever it was who cured cancer, you know, discovered new particles or whatever it is, I did a hit piece against them to prove that I can do it to anybody around anything at any time. Except Eddie Van Halen is what we're talking about. Well, Eddie Van Halen is now dead. But if if this was a, uh, a situation, you know, hot for teacher... Yeah. Canceled. Mm, disrespectful. Absolutely. Also, you know, p- p- packaging uh, female objectification for young men. Clearly, Eddie Van Halen is one of the worst people alive. But the, was the skill, the, the incredible inspiration that is just radiating from his music inspires so many millions that they will fight those canceled pieces they they will fight those this is your thing yeah you have this idea that there's a war between good and evil and the good has already been decided designated the winner yeah it's not true but your belief in that it's true take it till you make it no i mean (laughs) you gotta you it's motivating both of us like I also believe that we're going to win because if I don't, then I can't get out of bed, and I, it's pretty heavy at the moment. Do you think twenty twenty one can 
can make us feel good about the trajectory of society. I so like um, where we emerge from this year feeling good. Like there's a smile on Eric Weinstein's face and the next time we talk, we'll be doing some kind of duet on guitar and not having this worried look on our faces. No. <laughs> Okay, but you've also promised that you, you're going to somehow end this in a positive, uh, a positive. So okay, so how do you how do you turn the no around? What's the U turn from the no? No, I, until we get some actually decent people in the right chairs who are not constantly thinking. Parties, the leadership of them is disgusting and has to go. They're tearing us apart. They're, they they lack the will to be American. It's like saying, well, water is good. If I say water is good, everybody will agree with me. It's not. People drown. People need to, you know, get dehydrated. It can be life. Sea of nonsense. You have to be able to build a place where you have smart, talented people who represent a diverse group of correct opinions. You need to get rid of almost all of the people who have opinions that are antithetical to what we're trying to accomplish. You need to give them insulation, which we're terrified because we don't trust anybody. So everything has to be transparent. If you're going to the bathroom, I want those walls to be plexiglass so I can see what you're doing. It's like, that's too much transparency. We have too much and not enough at the same time. And then, you know, in essence, um, you need to ensure that people aren't worried about feeding their family every four seconds for being real. None of that is happening. And our billionaires, our billionaires are pathetic. What is the point of billionaires if you're not going to do billionaire type cool stuff like saying F you and I'm going to throw, you know. I, I don't grasp this. What is the point of creating obscene wealth if we don't have anyone smart enough and caring enough to use it? So I agree with that that last part for sure. For too long. I'm sure she had real ideas at the beginning that she still was campaigning on decades later. But like, if the system, if the platforms empowered you to search to be honest to be real to search for those ideas within yourself like long form conversations do then we even the donald trump and joe biden platforms is my intuition this is going to the intuition that there's good in donald trump there's there is depth and complexity there is good in and donald intelligence trump. there is and the same with joe biden there's good in joe biden and it's just we're not incentivizing. I, I mean, there, there's several things I think are broken. One of them is Twitter. The other is journalism. Just It's just the platforms of us communicating with each other. One of the reasons that I try to come up with unifying explanations is, is that, you know, if, if you look at the number of wildfires in California, let's say, that we've just seen, if you treat them all as spontaneous, uncorrelated, uh, instances, it feels like, oh my God, it's just whack-a-mole. Every time I send a fire truck here, there's a fire over there. So you want to come up with something like a central theory, which is why do I suddenly have a problem when I hadn't had a problem before? So I look for these unifying explanations. And I, I found one the other day that really speaks to me. Um, I mean, people are very frustrated because they've been trained to think about this incorrectly, in my opinion. But here's the graph that you need to look at. On the x-axis is uh, time by year. And on the y-axis is something like... Things go up. In other words, for a long period of time, the average age of the person in a desirable situation has been increasing something like I don't know, nine months for every 12. Those graphs have to go down at some point. The specter it's, of- It's of brilliantly it. put. 
transitional president. You guys are the highly educated one. When has any generation in history needed a transitional 78-year-old person to take office? It's bizarre. It's preposterous. That graph is the graph we can't talk about. That graph is the graph of our destruction. Because it has the, you can make a, a, a one-line argument, which is, sounds like ageism, which isn't a very good argument. <laughs> no. But what it does is, is it, it muddles the conversation. And you always have to ask yourself the question, if this conversation becomes muddled, who wins as a result of the muddling? Well, it's a battle. But so, so we, let's just win it. Let's win the battle. You give... Are you, you running? For... for sure. You I'll run. I was born in Russia. You can't run. Russia. So, uh, but we Russians can hack elections, so we'll figure it out. Uh, this is me officially announcing my run. I, I was born in St. <laughs> Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> yeah. Lex, what is it that you really want to ask? I think I, I want to put the, some responsibility on the portal, the portal, the, the portal. portal, the portal, <laughs> that the portal gives power to the people in that graph. Like, because you, you put it quite brilliantly that the people that, move the world their age has been going up and not move the world but put in the position where they get the chance to affect the world the these new platforms i think twitter falls in in, in them give power to the younger people it doesn't have to be about age necessarily but the younger thinking people so that's a promising thing and you are like uh, you're like gandalf you get to you get to pick your Frodo's or whatever. I'm not very good with the the analogy, but the whole point is for well, you I, as I Gandalf. I don't to know find that I make Frodo. that much sense. Gandalf makes sense. I don't know if people know how to fit me into this ecosystem. I think there's something in my presentation that people find very confusing. No, figure it out. I'm not. I, I disagree with you, but yeah. you need to look at the mirror and think like, what? What is it? Is it? Uh, maybe you need a mustache. I don't know. <laughs> but there, there's something about figuring out um, how to be a charismatic communicator in this. And that that's the responsibility. You said like finishing sentences with the LOL is painful for your soul. Yeah. That's just how somebody lets me know I don't have to take their opinion seriously. Right. Yeah. It's still the language, the, the way that people are communicating. And you're swimming that wave. You have a big platform. I'm, I have a growing platform. It feels like this is the place to give power. I agree. I agree. But we're going to get swatted down. I just don't think so. You're wrong. Why are you afraid of the big... Like this because is I've studied it. Because I've studied... Let me ask you a question, Lex. I believe that every society is supposed to have a collection of what I call uh, break glass in case of emergency people. Yeah. These are people who are universally loved and trusted by your society. For example, David Attenborough, the great British naturalist and presenter, uh, recently came on Instagram. He's worried about the planet. And I said, you know, look, there are very few of these people left. Let's pay attention, find out what he has to say. Maybe, maybe he's going to be an ass. Maybe he's going to be an idiot. Maybe he's going to say wrong things. Don't know. Tell me about your top 10 universal American heroes. This is not a rhetorical question. No. Give me five. Everybody looks to that person and says, yep, the best of us. Oh, I'd not divisive. Well, everybody's an interesting concept. I mean, Elon Musk is okay, very divisive, so right? You, but I'm talking about overwhelmingly people would, would follow that person if that person gave a rousing, intelligent speech that said we we must act now because we're in, in dire straits. I think a lot of people fall in that category. For me, it would be uh, in the t in the tech world, in the engineer world. No, 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 no. Elon Tell Musk. Tell me names. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. The Rock. <laughs> I'm thinking like who is the most eloquent actor? So like you think celebrities? So people with platforms. I didn't say celebrities. No, have but to be well known. I believe like, plat yeah, so 
we, this goes to Joe, Rog Joe Rogan. First two did not really impress me as being what I said, but okay. Elon several can, years ago would have. Can you can you try to? Joe Rogan. Why, has, why do they fail? Why why does why is lots Elon of people treat Joe thing? Rogan as if he's some sort of right wing racist because they've never watched his program, they don't know who his friends. Are. I don't know. Oh, but when I thought you said everybody, I thought you meant a large enough people where huge change can happen, not actually literally everybody. Because I, I think, mean people who've pulled off, like people who've pulled off something where everybody's convinced that that person just deeply, I mean, I, I think I've told you the story before, but the one time I've seen the power of a figure like this, I mean, very few times I've been in a large crowd and I've seen people just moved where they would do almost anything good, bad, and different because they were primed. Um, one was a Rolling Stones concert. The other one was Nelson Mandela coming to Boston. And man, you've never seen anything like this. You check out the photos from the banks of the Charles River when Nelson Mandela came. Um, there are people that you need in your dark hours, and we can't agree on who they are. And as soon as they emerge, we tar them with shit. We get out the shit brutch. Yeah, and, I uh, just disagree with you. So I think. I what think do we disagree about? Here? Okay. I think it doesn't matter who it is. I think really good speeches are needed. And Great. I think a, a lot. going to give them. I saw Killer Mike try to give a good speech. Yeah, he did. Yeah, well, in Atlanta, right? Yeah, he did. That a, was something. Very impressed. Yeah. Even Killer Mike immediately gets into this sellout. <laughs> or like. I think people draw a lot of meaning from it, which is why they are wondering why you haven't been doing that many podcasts or you haven't done it in maybe a month and a half or two months. So the first one is kind of weird, which is everybody assumes that everyone wants to be famous. And if you say, I don't want to be famous, it's like, oh, you're just saying that because you want to be every, everyone to think you're famous. You're not that famous. You know, okay. Yeah. I don't love being as well known. Uh, and I, all I need to do is put out a tweet and 20 people show up for a drink. And they're amazing people. And they're almost, I mean, you can see my live uh, Q&As on my Instagram page. If you go to Eric R. Weinstein, I just pick somebody randomly. And I was really worried about it at first. And, you know, maybe I should be worried about it. But in general, people all over the world are just so positive and so, you know. Yeah. And thoughtful and, and thoughtful. deep and they have a story. that's Because yeah, they're self-selected, right? Yeah. But I don't like the fame. The thing we just described comes with the fame. It's a beautiful thing. You don't. You, you're you're worried life, that it's getting. It's it's ephemeral. It'll f look, Lex. It'll turn on you in a heartbeat. Yeah. It'll turn on you in a heartbeat. And the other problem is, I don't. I don't like my audience being my audience. I want to get closer to them. I want to talk to them. I want to find out what what is this doing in your life. My house fills up with art that people send me. Yeah. The latest thing is an effects pedal called something like, I don't know, it's a bow tie overdrive yeah. from a guy in Mexico. <laughs> right? Yeah. You um, play electric, by the way, in a tiny little t tangent. Did you play electric? I have a Stratocaster. Okay. But it doesn't have a strap, and I don't know what to do with it, and I have a bad amp. So you should, you should, you should hook me up with the. Uh, <laughs> we'll find it at home, maybe. Okay. You're starting to sense that this is too much. No, I want to be, I want to be here. I want to do the work. Very simply. Um, you know, people have begged me, set up a Patreon account. And I haven't been able to do it. I should do it. 
I've said to everybody, it's a business, it's a business, it's a business. Yeah. But like they're so used to being defrauded when somebody starts thinking about monetary incentives. My my goal was to say, I'm going to keep talking to you about you, you want to know why I started doing ads on my show was because I wanted people to think from the get go, this is a business. This is what I sound like when I'm selling. But you know, like you see, I've lost weight. Mm-hmm. A lot of that is due to athletic greens. Athletic greens. You know, um, code. Uh, what's the? What's I don't know what my promo code is for athletic greens. Well, <laughs> probably athleticgreens.com dot slash portal. But doesn't it's a slash portal. But you know, Fitbit, who doesn't advertise, has also been instrumental, as well as a guy named Stephen Cates, who you know, as a fan from the show, found me on the street and just said, I'm a trainer. I want to help train you. It's got me on a, on a good pro, uh, good path. So, you know, that's one paid advertiser and two people I'm calling out just because they're, you know, two, two outfits, Stephen Cates and, and Fitbit that have changed my life. I wanted people to say, you know, you don't have to be afraid of advertising. If I do it in this way, this is powering your show. The whole issue of money is weird because people have these crazy feelings like, oh, wow, I knew he was a shill. (laughs) He's a grifter. You know, okay. I didn't love that. I didn't love the issues. So I didn't set up a Patreon. The security issues for talking and being me are significant. And I don't have the kind of money to hire around the clock. I mean, I... I desperately want to get to a level of wealth where I don't have to think about money. I don't think it's, you know, some people want m- money because they 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 need it for status. I think I can handle status if I want it doing this. I don't want the status. <laughs> Do you think for a moment that I want to explain that I actually got really uncomfortable being as well known as I was? And then what is it that I want? Because I want to be better known and less well known at the same time. It doesn't, there's nothing the audience can do. I don't want the audience to be the audience. That doesn't make sense to people. I want it to be a business, but I don't think people need to fear a business if the business is open about being a business. That, and then that's all to the side. What you're seeing now in front of the election is an incredibly meta-violent period in our online existence. And I believe that anybody who attempts to say these two parties are completely screwed at the moment, the leadership of these parties is unsalvageable, unworkable. Everyone hears that from inside the two-party system. Oh, I get it. He's trying to subtract votes off of Biden. Oh, I get it. He's trying to scuttle Trump. Oh, I get it. This is a play for his show because he's trying to plug in to discuss. There's a Bill Hicks routine on marketing. Have you ever seen this? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I recommend it to everyone where he he comes out on stage and he says, are there any people in marketing and sales in the audience? Woo, yeah. It's like, okay, great. Can you do us all a favor and die? And like everybody laughs. He's like, no, I'm not laughing. I'm being serious. So he talks about how marketing is horrible. So you're like, where's this act going? Then it gets to the point of it. It's like, oh, I know how you marketing people think. Bill's going after that uh, resentment <laughs> dollar. That's good dollar. Let's get that resentment anti-marketing dollar. Yeah. It's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I really hate marketers. Oh, that's good. It's the authenticity dollar. <laughs> you can't escape this kind of negative yeah. marketing thought. And I guess... That gets to the issue that I don't want to be destroyed in advance of this election. I don't think it's a good use of my relationship to my audience to be broadcasting how completely ridiculous Donald Trump and Joe Biden are as candidates for the president of the United States, full stop. Sorry to say that, but, well, let me, well, it, it's also possible. Let's fight. It's entirely Let's possible okay. that you're the child, mm. okay? Because a child would Let's say you you would call other people a child. Yeah, get in the first blow. <laughs> it's a big reveal. It's a tell. I, because the only power they have 
It's to attack you psychologically. No. Well, I believe that the army of people that love you yeah. is much more powerful than uh, mainstream media, than people that you might hear it say ridiculous things that you just said, which is try to reduce you, like the marketing, yeah, thinking. I just believe there's an army, maybe there's a better term, of people that see you for who you are and are hungry. Like, I'm not disputing those things. And not what I'm saying. I would venture to say, yeah. as your therapist, that you're actually, uh, the battle is all in your mind, that you have found these demons in the system and they're just a tiny minority and it's all in your mind. They cannot actually uh, remove, they're not strong enough to remove the voice of Eric Weinstein, to silence the voice. I love this. Mm -hmm. This is some of the best fiction writing I've ever heard. Let me tell you, I have relatives who've known me my entire life yeah. where one article in the New York Times, they will believe that over me. My contention is that own, that has no power except to affect your psychology. You're not what you have to You're do is the hearing. Rogan You're thing, which is You're laugh. You're not hearing me. Just laugh. I am laughing. I know, but more. I'm tell no, I'm telling you something. Yes. Okay. The way this works is through ruin. Ruin can come to anyone. There's no one who cannot be ruined. Every single person is signed up right now to be ruined by the system. But don't you understand that you have more power than the system? The ruin, you can ruin the system. Your Twitter account, the podcast. I that's agree. what I'm telling you about the army. Right? I agree that my Twitter account, my pocket, but what we've seen, for example, you saw what happened to Brett's Articles of Unity Project? Yes. Okay, what happened? The, you mean from, on the Twitter side. On the Twitter side, what happened? What happened? Well, actually, say the words. An say the word. It was uh, blocked or removed from Twitter. Or suspended. Whatever. suspended. Account suspended. And okay, I have a direct. Unclear, I have right? a direct line to Jack. Yeah. Okay, so I'm talking to the CEO, who I am crazy enough to still believe in. Good, I do too. I believe it. Somehow, there's a very strange thing going on with Jack Dorsey. I cannot possibly reconcile the actions with the person I've, that, that is a next level mind in there. I'm not, I don't know it well enough to say that it's all next level. I'm not claiming he doesn't have any blind spots. Every smart person I know has blind spots. I don't know what he's up against, blah, blah, blah. There's no way that the Jack Dorsey that I've talked to and the Jack Dorsey that interacted over articles of unity can be the same person. He is constrained by that company in some way that doesn't make sense to me. Either that or he's the most duplicitous person on earth and I'm not believing it. I just don't buy it, okay? Yeah. Something horrible is happening. I, my claim is I, I can remove you functionally from the chessboard in a tiny number of moves. No matter who you are, no matter how virtuous or how much of a bastard you've been your entire life, it doesn't take more than three or four moves to basically neuter you as a force. Yeah, and I disagree that if that's possible, that means I'm not very good at chess. Like, Unity 2020 was removed from Twitter because it's not good enough. Okay. Not within the system. Like, the army of people that feel the brilliance of the idea was too small. There. Okay, but fear, uncertainty, and doubt is the name of the game, the coin right. of the realm. Psychology, though, it's not real power. Skullduggery and put it on the web for all time so that we could all understand how the tobacco companies got together and destroyed people, right? You, you see, tobacco destroys people. You can see, you know, Scientology destroys people. There are various vindictive 
organizations that will not tolerate um, reality and opposition to them. Let's take them down. Okay. That's what I'm trying to tell you is Okay, no. no. So so why aren't you doing the podcast to return because that's one of the weapons because of war. Well, first of all, if you're at war, uh, I don't want to discuss strategy on a podcast. <laughs> right? But that's you you're misunderstanding. What did Montgomery say about Rommel? But wasn't his line I read your book, you beautiful bastard? It's like, why are you using the tactics that you already explained? Okay. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm not having a strategic conversation with you and a hundred, yeah. several hundred thousand of our closest friends. You know what I'm doing? I, I do not feel passionately enough about mm. defeating Donald Trump to elect Joe Biden, even if that's the way I'm going to ultimately vote. Right. I don't believe in the Biden Democratic Party. I don't believe in the Trump Republican Party. So, yes, it's an incredibly consequential election. But it, to, to me, it's like the the Crips and the Bloods and the Latin Kings fighting over the right to extort, you know, a business and the business trying to figure out who it wants to to do the extorting. But don't you think? Listen, there's very few people that are as good with the English language as you. Do you, don't you think it's possible to draw a line that doesn't that between in between that finds how we find our common humanity that ensures a better 2021 without having to say like Donald Trump is evil or, or Joe Biden is incompetent or any of that just somehow draw I'm beautiful mouthing off since the 80s tells me this is a super dangerous time for smart people to be spending the dry powder because the election doesn't make sense doesn't mean that i don't have a sense that one outcome would be better than the other probably but the variance on that i'm not even positive that i'm right <laughs> volunteered to be part of the armed services had all come from backgrounds where they didn't need to so you were convinced that these people had put their lives on their line for their country not for a payday imagine you had 10 of these people with technical backgrounds men women black white muslim jew doesn't matter right i would trust those people and i'd close the door I don't want to know what they talked about. I don't want transparency into all of their negotiations. I want to know that they're patriotic, that they have, they see something in the world bigger than themselves and their family fortunes. I want to know that they're courageous. I want to know that they've got all of our well-being and I'm willing to roll the dice. And if they screw us over, I'd rather go down like that. I, okay, so I disagree with you there because there's a difference between those and Jocko. Because, because you're not speaking to people with credentials of no, particular. No, I'm talking about self-credentialed people. Self-credentialed. I, I view Jocko as self-credentialed. But the biggest, the powerful thing about Jocko is he's not only self-credentialed, but he's been real with people. the The magical thing about Jocko isn't his book, isn't his life story. Is he's been talking on a podcast for a long. There's something real that happens. Okay, so t if you took everybody, yeah. if you took Dan Crenshaw, yeah, and Tulsi Gabbard, and you took Jocko Willing, and maybe Jesse Ventura, right? Uh, you can take. I see Bernie, where you're going with this. <laughs> what you can take Bernie Sanders, yeah, who's you know a lone voice. You can take all of these people who've like really just risked. Like, why do we trust? Why is Catherine Hepburn the best that Hollywood ever produced? Because she told Hollywood to go fuck itself. Hard. They gave her four Academy Awards. And she said, love you, sweeties. I'm going to use them as the doorstops for the bathrooms in my house. See, that's skill. That's, uh, that's, just, that's just... That's what you were talking about. Yeah. Be Catherine Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn is pretty amazing. 
but Catherine Hepburn is next level, right? Well, you, I mean, that's what you're trying to say to me. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to figure it out, Lex. Okay. I don't have of? the answer yet. What I do know is that this election is chewing people up. And I mean two separate things. One, that parties don't have enough integrity, that if you comment either for or against, there's a, a, a short sequence where you make a comment that's nuanced, you get referenced to something, right? Like, you know, take this thing about, you know, find people on both sides. Republicans are primed to fight each other the way introducing two ants from two different ant colonies always produces a battle. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to be in that fray because those people are going to kill each other mindlessly like robots. And until the election is concluded, like I do, I think this is dire. Yes. Could it be make or break? Absolutely. I'm not saying that. Do I know which way this goes? I can make an excellent argument that we need to elect Joe Biden right now. That We've got a situation which can only be cured by voting for Joe Biden. I can make another argument that we could have a situation that can only be cured by defeating Joe Biden right now and all of the things that the modern Democratic Party represents. Yeah. I don't have... You know, it's it's not the lady and the tiger. We're choosing between the tiger and the tiger. It's the Sumatran tiger versus the Siberian tiger, mm -hmm. right? I'm trying to think, well, which tiger can I, do I have a better chance against? Um, the key problem for us politically is that we have to divorce the concept of the center and moderation from kleptocracy. Every time we try to say something like, we need more moderate solutions, we need more pluralistic solutions, we, people will say, wow, you just want to hand us right back into the swamp, don't you? Those swamp people. Because the moderates and the swamp people are the same people. All right? So then we have these two crazy wings. We can't have crazy right-wing people. I don't want any tiki torch BS. We can't have crazy left-wing. Don't attack my courthouse really don't attack my courthouse. And we can't have moderates. It's like, okay, how do we install our children and, and rape pillage and get these speaking fees when we're out of office and become, you know, cozy with the things we're, uh, when we're supposed to be regulating them and then, you know, become their lobbyists, you know, immediately when we leave office, all of this stuff. We need an entirely different system. And I can't talk about that at the moment. When I talk, People say, oh, wow, so you're going to sit this one out because you're a pussy, because you're a coward? Great to know, Eric. We thought better of you. Bye. Click. You right. know. I don't know what to do. So, But are you thinking of what to do? Yeah. Oh, you, you better believe it. Look, Brett, Brett had this idea of Unity 2020, and I told him it was a wrong idea. I didn't tell him that Unity 2024 was a wrong idea. I didn't tell him that Unity 2028 is a wrong idea. And if I were to make the case that he was right and I was wrong, because he's now shuttered the thing, right? I would say that the case to be made that he was correct was is that by doing this in 2020, we found out what we were up against. It's good to know that Twitter can turn this off at the drop of a hat. Yeah. Great to know. It's good to know, as we learned, that you cannot have meetings of 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 presidential candidates in a primary that are not approved of by the party, mm -hmm. right? Like they've got this thing figured out so we don't have any way in. And now Unity 2024 makes sense because Unity 2020 was tried, okay? I don't know that we get to, to 2024 under all circumstances. In some we do, in some we don't. But th there's, there's a game theoretic thing that... In it. by the way in terms of money i'll never have a villa yeah no i will always give away everything i own don't do that no in sorry uh invest into like things you like you mentioned awesome things yeah, yeah. invest fine but a little bit of avuncular advice mm -hmm. don't pledge to be the person who disgorges themselves of security, 
Money is freedom. That's what it is. It's a big honking pile of freedom. Okay. You can choose to use it as the freedom to imprison you. If you don't, you know, so you can use it as freedom to make yourself a prisoner of your money. But generally speaking, Lex, money is freedom. And your voice is important. At least retain the amount of money, security you need to follow Joe's advice. What is the point of FU money if you don't say FU? The number of people who have FU money who don't say FU indicates the number of people who chose the freedom of their wealth to create a prison. Yeah. They built a prison with the freedom they had and they walked into it, locked the door. I think it's too difficult not to create. The reason I want to give away the money is because I just know my own psychology and you create prisons. Our human mind just creates those prisons. The FU money is enough for basic shelter and basic food. That's that's the you have optimal kids. FU. You don't have kids yet. This is a, okay, this is the problem. This is why I'm, so this is me, single Lex speaking. Great. But kids future Lex, it. future Lex, I'm talking to future Lex. Single, single present Lex, please don't listen. <laughs> yeah. Don't be an ass. Okay. You, you're going to need some money and don't make these pledges to say on a podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm say, I want to save you from yourself. You need money to do many of the beautiful things that we're counting on you to do. Don't F it up. Can I talk to you about Roger Penrose? Sure. You've talked to Roger on the portal, but also in between the lines and offline, just everything you've said about Roger Penrose. For people who don't know, he just recently, a few days ago, won the uh, 2020, shared the 2020 uh, Nobel Prize for physics. But it's clear to me that he had like a deep personal impact on you, a connection with you. Uh, in terms of both your love of mathematics, just the way you see the world. Like the, this is the Eddie Van Halen conversation. This was clearly somebody who's profound in your worldview. Can you, can you talk about Roger? Can you talk about what it means that he won this highest of prizes? Just in general, let's celebrate the man. Yeah, okay. So first of all, there are two other people who won this prize. I'm sorry, I just didn't happen to know who they were before they won. Um. Roger is a very, it is not Roger in particular, but the class from which Roger comes that is so important. So I would put Roger in the class of Feynman, Einstein, Dirac, Yang. Um, put Witten in there? Or yeah. no? I mean, Whit Witten's a, a special case. <laughs> Um, Feynman was so good, and had he been born slightly different at a slightly different time, I believe his claim on physics would be far greater. Um, I feel like Penrose, in some sense, came up a very difficult path because you see, Einstein effectively solved most of the most important problems in general relativity right at the beginning. As a result, the children of Einstein are impoverished because there wasn't as much to pick off of the trees and sell at the market, whereas Bohr didn't, and, and Planck didn't do nearly as good of a job with quantum. He's got lots of bets. None of them had really come through the way you would hope. And I think they stretched the rules, to be blunt about it. Uh, to give him the prize. Yeah. I do. You you said this thing on Twitter, which is beautiful, that every once in a while comes a, a human being that gives uh, value to the prize versus the prize giving value yeah. to the human. Two different kinds of prizes. The reason that we care about the Nobel Prize isn't because of Alfred Nobel. It's because it came along at the right time to reward um, Einstein, Dirac, Schrodinger, Feynman, most of the most of the people who should have won, won. Most of the awards are not good. 
in the sense that they don't really follow the prize is used to rewrite history. That's its problem. So it's you ha you should have a love hate relationship with it because on the one hand it does focus the world on what really matters, and on the other hand it distorts what really matters, and both of those functions take place simultaneously. In this case, I think that they violated their own rules slightly. So it wasn't really clearly a case of a prediction and a discovery in the typical fashion, but they like we better give this award to somebody of that highest caliber to make sure that the prize is fully funded with prestige going forward. That's that's sort of my weird speculative guess as to what happened. And so Roger's getting on in years, and if the person should be alive. So they, uh, I think they bent the rules, and I think they couldn't have bent it for a better person, and I hope they will not bend the rules out of weakness, but out of strength in future. It would be great to get Madame Wu and uh, Emmy Nerder a posthumous prize along with Doug Prasher, George Sudarshan, uh, and George Zweig, as well as Ernst Stuckelberg Nobel Prizes. There have been some terrible omissions, uh, the first two being females who revolutionized our view of the world and I've, i take a very dim view of people pushing for prizes for people from ethnic groups or genders or whatever in order to make it plural and inclusive if it's not following the work and i feel very clear that in a few cases we know there was a real problem with the nobel committee because um we have stunning accomplishments you know try to get through a day as a physicist without Nerder's theorem and try to imagine the universe without Madame Wu's discovery that left and right don't appear to be symmetric. I mean, these are terrible omissions and they're a, a huge blot on science for not being more inclusive when it matters. Yeah. So just like you said, the Nobel Prize is plagued by omissions as much as... And distortions and dilutions. For example, Dirac... <laughs> in part because we had an opportunity to show that something had happened on both sides of the Pacific after the war. Um, but I don't think we needed to dilute um, Weinberg or Feynman or Schwinger. It just makes me, it makes me so, somewhat sick. All of these people are such important giants and it has to do with the field, I think, not wanting to create luminaries and superstars who could have defended the field from budget cuts and worldly pressure. So I think it's really important that we have absolute superstars because we produce superstars. We acknowledge them, we don't dilute them, and that we bend the rules to make sure that the prize stays funded with the prestige that comes from giving it to the Roger Penroses, uh, Albert Einsteins, and Paul Duracs of the world. Can we talk a little bit about evil? Sure. I, I haven't actually talked to you about this topic. And at the time when Jeffrey Epstein was part of this, but it's, I'd love to try to understand how evil was allowed to flourish in in the place that I love, whether you think, maybe let me ask the question this way, was it the man evil or was the system evil? Or is evil too strong a word? Because what I see is the presence of of this particular human being in the eyes of many, destroyed the reputations of many really strong scientists and also weakened the ability, like weakened the institution of MIT by making everybody quiet, like almost making them unable to say anything interesting or difficult. Yeah. And what what is that? And what am I supposed to... Uh... 
We don't know. Why is everyone quiet about Jeffrey? We when I want to scream. We don't know. We don't know. Obviously, I want to scream about it too, right? And I probably have said too much about Jeffrey Epstein. Look, something horrible happened. I don't know what it is, but something horrible happened. And, you know, at the one thing that, okay, let's just do this. The first thing I need to do is I need to get rid of this woke crap about power differentials, okay? In general, you can talk about uh, hypergamy and power differentials are Russell conjugates of the same concept. Just the way particular proportions and symmetries uh, are mathematically provable to be attractive um, in females to males, male attractiveness is largely determined by male competence and ability to amass power and success and all these sorts of things. The relationship between consenting adults is, quite frankly, not something I want to sort out. The relationship between the sexuality of adults and minors, and particularly, you know, there's the the, the 17, 18 issue. Mm -hmm. That's very different than 12, 13. Um, we're talking about really sick depravity with respect to what it appears that Jeffrey Epstein was involved in at some level. I believe this story is super complicated in part because I think one thing Jeffrey Epstein was doing was providing money, encouragement, and support to scientists. Another thing he was doing, I believe, was giving tax advice to very rich people. I believe another thing he was doing was uh, hooking very wealthy people up with young adult females. Another thing he was doing, I think, was doing stuff with children that will curl your toes. So between, So there's an entire spectrum of different stuff. And at the moment, Nobody can pull apart or deconflate anything because the woke thing comes over it and says, you know, I think it's disgusting that, uh, you know, a 43-year-old billionaire would be partying with a 23-year-old. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to adjudicate that. I'm worried about 12 and 14-year-olds that we're not talking about. But I mostly... Even... I don't think MIT was deep into pedophilia. My guess is that that did not happen. I don't think that the scientists were the targets of the really... And it may have been our government. It may have been a joint government project. It may have been somebody else's government. I don't know. I believe that in part, we don't really understand Robert Maxwell. Sorry, who's Robert Maxwell? Ghislaine, Ghislaine father? Maxwell's father was very active in scientific publishing. I don't know where peer review came from. I would love to run down the relationship. Conversations of woke identity politics that you're referring to seems to be removing everyone's ability. No, everyone's one of willingness. The things, one of the things. To talk about... virtue signaling you action. wouldn't know what to do. I you would like not to know what you're up against, Lex. You're not hearing me. The problem here is, what was Jeffrey Epstein? Well, that question might be the heroic action to take. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to get my first question. You have to map the silence with Jeffrey Epstein. What you're describing is a map of the silence at MIT. Yeah. Well, is there a map of the silence in uh, Washington State around Jeffrey Epstein, the Bay Area. Park is like nothing we've ever seen. You're exactly correct, but I wanna know what is it telling us? Because what it's telling me 
is not some kind of conspiracy, but more a disappointing weakness. Wait, in, not in the some people kind of conspiracy. Who my, it's not some kind of conspiracy. You've but got to be kidding. No, well, you're so you're so afraid of saying the word conspiracy that you don't think it's a conspiracy. I personally, I just think it's people who I thought were my heroes just being weak. No. Be of good cheer, sir. A cheer? Be of good cheer. Of good cheer? Yeah. You think that there's a conspiracy? I think there is a conspiracy. That'd be a very impressive one. That's the scale of it. I, I tend to believe that large scale can only be an emergent phenomena. Really? I find this so fascinating. Yeah. Because I, I always see you as like a logic. Logic and love drive your drive your soul. You're very logical. You're relentless. You got a, love, a lot of love in your heart. I believe that if you would review the video, where is it from? Dubai or Abu Dhabi of the mysterious hit on the hotel guest. You ever seen this thing? No. Oh, what happened? It's the assassination in 2010, 10 years ago of Mahmoud al Mabu, something like that, in Dubai, where I believe 26 uh, separate individuals on multiple teams are shown converging, coming in from all over. King Bird. Uh, I don't know whether I should even bring up Rex 84. To not believe in conspiracies is an idiocy. So you you have a sense that um, evil can be as competent or more competent. First than of all, when evil wants to operate at scale, it needs to make sure that people don't try to figure out evil. When evil operates at scale, yes, from first principles, yes. you have to realize that evil must not want it investigated. That's correct. The most efficient way to keep yourself from being investigated, if you are a, an evil institutional player who needs to do this repeatedly, is to invest in a world in which no one can afford to say the word conspiracy. You will notice that there is a special radioactivity around the word conspiracy. Yeah. We have provable conspiracies. We have admitted to conspiracies. You have been invited to conspiracies. There is no shortage. Conspiracies are everywhere. Some of them are mundane. Some of them are like price fixing cartels, you know, or trade groups are generally speaking conspiracies. So the first thing you have to realize is that all of us are under a, in a mimetic complex where you can be taken off the chessboard by saying conspiracy there. Good done. It's a one, it's like a one line proof. We don't have to listen to Lex. He said he was a conspiracy theorist on this show. Okay. That is partially distorting our conversation. If you want to ask me about Jeffrey Epstein, you have to agree with me that that is a logical description of what you would have to have if you wanted to commit conspiracies, is that you have to make sure that people are dissuaded from investigating them. Yes. Okay. But it's a very, it's a fascinatingly difficult idea then because the world with conspiracy theories and the world without conspiracy theories to the... Sh to the shallow glance looks the same. Well, my point, there is responsible conspiracy theorizing. Yeah. Where you look at the history of unearthed conspiracies, and just like you would with any other topic, just think about how different the rules in your mind are for conspiracy theorizing versus X theorizing, where X can be anything. Right? It's like if I say to you... Um, I can say the statement that average weight is not the same between widely separated populations. You'd say, yeah. I'd say average height is not the same between widely separated populations. You'd say, yeah. Then I say, in fact, no continuous variable that, has, that shows variation should be expected to be identical between widely separated. Of course, Eric. Like IQ. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold And as a prerequisite, as you're saying, that will be the first step if you wanted to uh, pull off a, a conspiracy in a competent way. That's 
you would have to first convince the world of that. I just watched the film 1971 about my favorite conspiracy of all time. I highly recommend it. 1971? Well, the film is entitled 1971, and it's about the Citizens Committee to Investigate the FBI, which was uh, run by a student of Murray Gelman, a physicist, and broke into FBI offices in Pennsylvania to steal files, which allowed freedom of information requests that discovered a huge conspiracy. It was a conspiracy that unearthed a conspiracy inside the federal government, a double conspiracy story, which launched multiple conspiracies. I think that the problem with modern Americans is that they are so timid that they don't even learn about the history of conspiracies that we have absolutely proven. So with that done, Jeff Epstein, in my opinion, represented somebody's con- construction. I don't kind think of that, scary to think about. Yeah. Well, what part of the story isn't scary? I, in part, did something which yeah. I, I imagine may get me destroyed because I was more worried about being destroyed. Their problem is is that Jeff Epstein showed up as the only person capable of continuing U.S. science. William Proxmire and the Golden Fleece Awards and the idea that we have to, we're paying too much and these are welfare queens and lab coats and blah, 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 blah. We need more transparency, more oversight. Everything went to hell. And the national culture of U.S. science was lost. The thing that produced all this prosperity and security and power was lost. And then Jeff Epstein shows up. And a tiny number of funders, maybe Fred Kavli, um, maybe Yuri Milner, maybe um, who else would be in this category? Uh, Peter Thiel to an extent. Um, Howard Hughes would be the largest of these things, which has different grant structures than the NIH, gave people a modicum of risk-taking ability. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, when Jeff Epstein showed up, everybody wanted to take risk in science. And suddenly, a charismatic billionaire says, hey, I can make that work for you. Here's $100,000. Go research something crazy. Mm hmm Well, that money was supposed to be provided by the federal government under the terms of the Endless Frontier Compact between the federal government and the universities. And the federal government and the taxpayers welched. Okay? So that's one place to lay the blame for Jeff Epstein is that the the failure of the federal government To 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 honor its commitment. Yeah. Right? So the universities became psychopathic. It's not like everybody doesn't remember what we're supposed to be doing to be moral. But the point was there wasn't enough money to be moral. So it was time to uh, to eye each other as a source of protein, as I like to say. <laughs> and in that process, Jeffrey Epstein said, hey, come to my world. We can do it like we used to do. So in in part, my point is, is that almost none of your colleagues at MIT have that kind of religious commitment to science that they're willing to go down with ship science. Hmm. The Galileo Galilei thing became very important to science because occasionally you just have to say, look, <laughs> this isn't about me and you. I, there isn't enough money in the world to buy the kind of legacy I want to leave to this planet. This is one of the great things about science. You know, potentially it's worth dying for. Yeah, I'm glad you said it. It, Science is one of the things that is best, that's worth dying for. I mean, I'm not eager to martyr myself, but I've certainly risked my health, my fortune, you know, I've, I've, I've destroyed myself economically over science. And, um, and my, 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 my 
need to oppose these sons of bitches in chaired professorships who are destroying our system along with everyone else. Let me um, bring in Grandmaster Uwe in, into this. Uwe. Uwe. Master Uwe. I think he's a Grandmaster. So oh, that, w- that would make him a chess playing turtle. So I read some Wikipedia. Uh oh. So- <laughs> <laughs> quote recommends uh, that you should uh, find a battle worth fighting we've talked about several battles just now what is the battle worth fighting for for Eric Weinstein in the next few months in the next year there's only one Well, it's it's the Moses. It's the Moses thing. It's time to go. It's time to leave. This place is over. To get off the planet. I, yeah, I, I, I freak people out when I say that. But like, look at your world. You you just got introduced to the problem of a virus. Wait, wait till it's fusion devices, and you understand what it means to have one interconnected planet with no uncorrelated experiments happening anywhere else you know so do you see the foray your work in physics and maybe like the echoes of it in uh ship elon everybody who has a possible plan to avoid what is coming if we don't have one should work on the plan that he she thinks best right so Elon wants to do rockets. People misinterpret me. I Meta Eric says, I don't think that's a smart plan. Regular Eric says, all people who have hope should do that thing. Yeah. The- At least it's Mars, man. At least it's the moon and Mars and maybe Titan and whatever. And I don't think it'll work and it doesn't make sense and it looks silly. But that's exactly the kind of fight worth fighting. But it's it's the kind of, it's for the same reason that I went on Brett's Unity 2020 thing when I didn't think it had a hope in hell and people were, you know, are making fun of it. It's yeah, just it's- like, we got to do things that make, that make us feel dumb and silly and childish that possibly have a hope of working. Okay. So everybody should do something. My version of this, I'm the most hopeful about because I wouldn't have chosen to do it. If I thought that Daniel Schmachtenberger's wisdom project was a better hope, I'd do that. It's more down to earth in a certain way. I just think that it's more probable. Look, we got from uh, powered flight with the Wright brothers and wind tunnels to sending back images from the surface of Titan via Huygens Cassini in less than a century, okay? What we can do if we can change the laws of physics is something we can't even conceive of. It may be that it buys us nothing. And at least we will know why we died on this planet. As a small aside, I think this is not the right time to take the full journey, but I feel like you'll guide me like Master Uwe did, and I'm the Kung Fu Panda at some they point. They only have one conversation. We're on our like we, we didn't we didn't <laughs> Well we're 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 Jews and they weren't so we talked too much. But the guide doesn't have to be with words. Uh you don't think Poe was Jewish? It's debatable. We'll have to go back to the, really the Wikipedia. Food. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is the Lex Free Podcast.